Illinois season has ended at the hands of the defending national champs. This was a lot uglier than we hoped it would be. This was a disaster of a performance from Illinois. And it was also a reminder that UConn is exactly who UConn is. Uh, I, in my opinion, the very best team in college basketball. 77-52, final score. Where do you start with this cart? Uh, first off, apologies. We're a couple days late on this. We were at the Midwest Regional, and then we uh, each basically took Easter Sunday off to spend with family. But it's Monday morning, and Carter's in a Dre Gibbs Lawhorn jersey drinking out of a Legends Cup. So apparently he's ready to discuss what happened here. Yeah, well, before we actually get into the game, uh, I do got to say that I appreciate Dre Gibbs Lawhorn announcing he's coming back so that this jersey I bought like isn't for naught. Uh, it'll be able to get uh, another year of use. Hopefully, let's not speak too soon. We know how people are with uh, entering and saying they're coming back and whatnot. Uh, but look, we, you and I, and a lot of people in college basketball know that this UConn team, like it's not, it's not a fluke what they've done this year. They're a dominant basketball team, right? And part of their dominance is, is they don't give games away, right? Like they're not gonna, they're not gonna give games away. You're gonna have to play damn near. I, I mean, I I, th I think it's safe to say you damn near got to play a so somewhat of a perfect basketball game, or at least a pretty flawless basketball game with a good game plan to be able to beat UConn because they are just so in tune and such a well-oiled machine right now. And for the first portion of that game, you know, Illinois got out to a slow start with Klingon being dominant early, but they were able to hang around thanks to Marcus Damask and UConn not you know, shooting the ball extremely well from outside. But, you know, we can dive into it a little bit deeper here. That that game plan did not did not work, right? And Donovan Klingon was able to dominate this game on both ends of the floor, and it ended up being a pretty nasty route, uh, something I've never I, – I've never kind of – at least I can remember seeing before uh, with what happened in that second half uh, for the Illini, but – yeah, some of the some of the adjustments in in game stuff were a little bit shocking in this one, to say the least. Adjustments. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, the the lack of the lack of adjustments. Sorry. Okay, I've uh, I've been dreading this one. I've been dreading this one, but I owe it to Illinois fans to keep it real. Right, that's what I've always tried to do, even when I'm wrong, even when at the beginning of the season when I'm saying Marcus Damask isn't an impact player. That's me keeping it real. Though I was very wrong, I don't think I'm wrong on this one. This was the worst Brad Underwood game I've ever seen. This was an utter abject disaster. This was his fault. This was a joke of a performance. Uh, and to be completely pointed on this, I thought they got gifted an opportunity to hang in this game from poor shooting from UConn in the first half. I mean, you look up. With a minute and a half left in the first half, despite your team stinking it up, despite a, a terrible game plan, you were right there. And then you snap your fingers and eight minutes of game time later, you're down 30. Why? Well, because the game plan was to attack Donovan Klingon. That's what you're not supposed to do against UConn. Um, it was absurd. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I, I, I praised Brad Underwood after the Iowa state game and said, I thought he coached circles around Ots. I thought Ots for whatever reason was unfamiliar with who she should be closing out to. They kept leaving Terrence Shannon open and Brad was pulling the right strings with subs. I thought, I thought Brad masterpiece. I said that in the sweet 16 game, this was the exact opposite. And look, there were a lot of guys in this game for Illinois who were horrible. In fact, um, Dre Gibbs, Lawhorn, Dane Danger, Justin Harmon, uh, Luke Goody, Ty Rogers, and Coleman Hawkins combined to go three for 28 from the floor. Those guys shot three for 28 from the floor. That's five of your eight rotation players. And Brad Underwood was worse than all of them. That's something. Like, and do you, I mean, do, am I off here? I'm not off here, right? Like attacking Klingon and doubling down on that was a joke. No, it, it definitely was. And uh, what was the exact phrase, Greg? If he blocks 100 shots, he blocks 100 shots. What was it? Well, can we walk through what happened here? Can we actually walk through, like, the moments of this game for Brad Underwood? Because it starts before the game. To oh, me. Uh, 
No, no, it started before the game when he basically said that we haven't – it's not like we haven't seen someone like UConn in the Big Ten this season. We kind of joked about this in the pregame, and we were like, I wouldn't give anything to UConn. I just wouldn't – I wouldn't say anything that makes them perk their ears up a little bit. But the larger issue than, like, bulletin board material with what Brad was saying after the Iowa State game – Look, Brad's honest, right? We always praise him for it. He he is honest, and that's why I like him, because in a profession where coaches are abundantly liars, like that's that's part of the job is to lie. Brad Underwood's not a liar. He's honest. He's very upfront, and that's entertaining, and it's great, and it's pure, and I like him. I like him as a guy. He also was being honest this week when it was very clear he hasn't watched UConn. Like, extremely clear. Because anyone with a brain and two eyes that has watched UConn at all this year would not come out and say, oh, yeah, there's nothing they do we haven't seen in the Big Ten. Like, and I I think he was just being truthful. He wasn't even trying to disrespect them or give them any, like, bulletin board stuff. It's I, I truly believe Brad has not watched a ton of them. And he also said that, by the way. He was like, well, I haven't watched them a ton, but I know they're great. But they're not anything we haven't seen. Just shut up. Just, just for once, don't say that. Don't say, and maybe go home and watch the film. Go home and watch the film. Because if you did watch the film, you would know immediately. You would take away that Donovan Klingon is what makes their defense special. And, and yes, Stefan Castle is also very good. An 18-year-old kid was about to lock up your National Player of the Year candidate, Terrence Shannon. So go watch the film on that and prepare for that and figure out that Trying to get Donovan Klingon in foul trouble is a horrible game plan. And the worst part of this was, okay, that was coming into the game. It was clear he didn't watch enough UConn, and that's what he stumbled into. That's our that's our whole plan here. Get Klingon in foul trouble. The worst part of this is that he was kind of right that he has seen a guy like Klingon before. He's seen Edie in the Big Ten. What do we know about Illinois against Zach Edie? We have well-documented evidence of this now over the years you can't play ty rogers if zach Eady's on the floor the splits are like i it's it's identical to what happened in this game when ty rogers is on the court against zach Eady, illinois gets outscored by like 30 in 10 minutes and when ty rogers is off the floor they win the game that's it's been the story in every ty rogers illinois purdue game for two years so you have this like very special thing Small ball, shooting, five out, that no one has an answer for. And it's the only thing that can exploit bigs that are as good defensively as Klingon and Edie. And you just don't use it? I, I'm i so confused because combined at the, uh, the, the end of the first half run and the end of the second half run, when Ty Rogers came off the court from when it started the half, combined it was a 16-0 run. So, yeah, the 30-0 run made the headlines here. Like, you were, you were down 16 nothing with the way you started both halves just because you had Ty Rogers on the court. I, it, was, it was asinine. It was a complete joke. It was Brad. I, I don't think it was getting too cute. It was just stupid. It was pure stupidity. And I still think it's rooted in him not knowing enough about what UConn is and what makes them special. But he didn't give his team a chance in this game. He dug them a giant hole. And then UConn's poor shooting let Illinois hang around. And then Illinois doubled down on it. I mean, the middle of the game. Middle of the game, man. When Illinois somehow is clinging to life despite all of these issues, despite the stupid lineups, despite the fact that UConn you can't make a shot, and that's the only thing keeping them in the game, they put a microphone in front of Brad's face, and everyone on earth is talking about how stupid this is that they're going at clinging. And all he says is, well, if he blocks 100, he blocks 100. We got to keep attacking him. And then they come out in the second half with Ty on the court. Every shot is on Klingon. He erases all of them. I'm pretty sure somebody had the numbers. They shot like 12% in this game when Klingon was on the floor. They they only scored four points, I think, or something like that, or made four field goals while Klingon was on the floor. Dog, it's absurd. And then when Klingon would leave the game, they wouldn't attack the rim. They would space it out from three, and the offense looked better. So it made no sense. It makes no sense. It gave their team no shot, and I, I thought it's just an all-timer horrible look for Brad. And then after the game, he's holding the can of Coke, talking about, that sucked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you sucked. You sucked. And this was a really great season, and Brad pulled all the right strings all season long, 
And uh, I mean, he ruined it. He ruined he ruined Illinois' chances at a, a special finish to the season with the way he approached this game. Right. And, and and we talked about coming into this game, at least me personally, I was of the, you know, oh, you're playing with house money thing. Good season. Da, da, da. Like play a certain way. You lose, you lose. You kind there's no actual shame in that. There's a little bit of shame because of how the loss occurred and because of the game plan and the approach to the game. Like that would be what's eating away at me. If I'm an Illinois fan that you came into this game and you're, your whole team philosophy, even even outside of this season, is the positionless basketball, being able to pull people out. You have Coleman Hawkins, make people uncomfortable, make bigs uncomfortable by pulling them out. And you just continually drove to the hoop. And it was like it was evident that it what that was not that should not have been the approach. And I know that because there's people who, with all due respect, I don't even trust their basketball opinion. And they were able to see that. The, these guys should not have just been driving in. I mean, there was a couple times when Terrence Shannon just went right at clinging, and I'm just like, do a floater, do something. Uh, Gary A looking off Terrence Shannon Jr., wide open in the corner to drive in and get his shot sent. We even had Drake Gibbs Lawhorn trying to lay it up over Donovan Kling. And I'm just like, what? What? What is the because what's the philosophy here? Obviously, these guys are being told to do this if they're just going to keep on going at them. And I, it it just made it made no sense to me, and that's and that's kind of and that's how you get to the point where you're you 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 get a thirty zero run put on you, which is insane, by the way, thirty yep. to nothing run, and I think only one of those baskets was a three pointer, maybe two. I mean, UConn only made three three pointers in this game. They shot seventeen percent from three, and they won by twenty five after calling off the dogs, like. Uh, you, I mean, we, we can talk about it after this because, you know, UConn is – they deserve credit. They're a really great team. That's why they're back to where they are, and they're just doing what they are in this two-year tournament run. But like I said to start this, if you want to beat a team like UConn, you have to be locked in on all fronts and prepared. And I didn't see – I didn't see preparation from this – from this Illinois team in this game. Yeah. No, it's – I to me, it looked like a team that just straight up – was unaware of what makes UConn so great. And that's unacceptable at this point in the season. Um, it's absurd. Do you th – this is one thing that frustrated me and infuriated me after the game. There was a big narrative mostly from Purdue fans that I saw. Maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe this is from other people. But it seemed, at least on my timeline, which is very Purdue and Illinois heavy, to be mostly Purdue fans talking about the lights were too bright. The moment was too big. I think those were Craig Bowers' words. The moment was too big for these guys. Do you believe that it was the moment being too big, or do you believe they just got blown out, ran off the court by a better team? I think they just got run, ran off the court by a better team. That's, I mean, that's what it is. The moment being too big is like it's it's losing a game where you are like a 10 point favorite a 15 point favorite and, and literally all you got to do is play your game and you just can't you can't do it like i i'm trying to think about this year like what that would be like pissing down their leg like marquette against nc state i'm not saying they did piss down their leg but they i mean they shot 3 for 31 from 3 and like 20% from the field as a favorite in that game that was that was pissing down their leg uh the this Illinois team was nine and a half point underdogs and they just, they UConn did the UConn thing and Illinois didn't do anything to prepare or game plan to go against them. But it's not a, it's not a moment too big pissed down your leg moment for me. Maybe at moments where they miss shots, but like, I, I don't know. That's just, that's, that wasn't the narrative that I would have been taken. I was more upset of the narrative uh, that the thing you're speaking of, that that was happening as Purdue was planning to play the next day. Like they had a final four to go to and they were victory lapping, you know, Illinois. Meanwhile, while Purdue advances to the final four, the, the player that they probably said the most foulest things about Coleman Hawkins shows support for Purdue in the big 10, which I know probably ate at some of those guys, but like, uh, it, I, it wasn't a moment too big, piss down the leg thing for me. Lights too bright, I guess, phrase you could use. Okay. Yeah, I just – I don't like doing that with shooting. Like, 
to me, I, I think Craig's response, because I quote tweeted it, was like, UConn is too good. It's not It's not the moment was too big. It's UConn is too good. That's what happened here. And uh, he responded to me and was like, I mean, they shot like one for 11 from three in the first half. That's the moment being too big. UConn also shot horribly from three. Was the moment too big for them? Purdue made one three in the first half against Tennessee. Was the moment too big for them? Like that's poor shooting is not the moment being too big. That's poor shooting, miss shots. So it, it, look, if there was a moment in this game where the lights were too bright, the moment was too big, I would point to one of two things. One, Ty Rogers smoking a wide open layup, which again, he's seeing ghosts from Donovan Klingon because Donovan Klingon has affected every single shot. But yeah, I think I think if you want to pick out Ty Rogers individually and say he wasn't mentally prepared for this game, he could not play in this game. That's totally fair. He was horrible. He was 0 for 5 from the floor, 0 for 2 from free throw in eight minutes. And in those eight minutes, the team got outscored by 16 points. So I, I buy that, but that's individual. That's not the whole team. Uh, and then if you just want to say a 30 to 0 run means the team wasn't ready, I guess. But to me, if you're if you're playing the lights were too bright, moment was too big game, that probably should start from the moment the game starts. <laughs> And Illinois was competitive in the first half. Partially, yes, because UConn was missing shots. But, like, Illinois was there defensively. They were making things difficult. This game was a tie game 19 minutes into the game. So when you when you go from a tie game through 19 minutes to down 30 seven minutes later, that's how special the opponent is. And to me, I'm – Look, Purdue may damn well win a national championship. At this point, to be honest with you, I hope that's what happens. But I I can't with their fans acting like, oh, Illinois just no-showed. And Illinois played horrible. I'm not saying they didn't. But this was about how special UConn is in the second half and how horrible of a game plan Brad had. Not what any of their players are mentally made up from. And to me, every every one of those comments was just coming from a place of Purdue people trying to discredit both UConn and Illinois. Like, they, they can't just give UConn credit for whatever reason. And they can't give Illinois credit. So in, in their head, UConn's not special. Illinois just no-showed. And to me, that's so opposite of what happened here. Illinois had a phenomenal season and got punked by the defending national champions who have won – what now nine straight games, nine straight NCAA tournament games by 13 or more points. Like did every team in UConn's run for the last year and a half, no show was the moment too big for every single team. Or is this one of the most generationally special teams we've ever seen? <laughs> like, uh, I think yeah, it's I mean, the second one. Yeah. I I, I mean, we, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle with the just the bad shooting thing. Cause I do think there is some like piss down the leg moment, but that's honestly, that's more so guys passing up shots where you can visibly tell that they're scared. I couldn't tell that Illinois players are like visibly scared. I was more like they're visibly stupid for doing what they're doing. Like and going to the hole and driving on clinging. It was. Yeah. It was, it, was, it was a bad game plan. It wasn't like fear. The only, the only player I would pick out and say, looked overwhelmed by the moment was Ty Rogers and that's fine. But like Terrence Shannon was just bad. Marcus Damask was great. Coleman Hawkins was just all over the place. I don't think that was the moment too big. I think he was just all over the place. And also like, look, when you're in the middle of a run, like I get it. It shouldn't have been 30. Oh, that's crazy. Clearly they were overwhelmed playing poorly, but like when you're in the middle of a run, of course you're going to look like you're rattled. Like, <laughs> What, are we expecting them when when UConn's on a 12-0 run to not look rattled? <laughs> like it's the best team in the country firing on all cylinders. They look rattled. Again, that's not the moment being too big. That's them getting punked by the best team in the country. It is what it is. I, I'm just frustrated by the way we're going about this. Like, let's just at this point, if you if we can't give UConn pure credit for going on a third, it's like this the people who can't give Zach Eady credit. Let's give them both credit instead of discrediting things and making it about the opponents or the refs. Zach Eady is one of one. UConn is one of one. Of one. They're headed to likely play each other in the championship game, and the internet's going to break when it happens. But anyone who's trying to not give each other credit at this point is losing credibility in my standpoint. It's insane. Uh, Taryn Shannon, eight points, two for 12 from the floor. Welcome to the Stefan Castle lockbox. I, I mean, that's... That can't happen. Clearly, what'd you make of his performance? Yeah, I, I, 
in moments like this, especially when you get to this point of of the tournament, your all American has to all American. You know what I'm saying? Like you need you need your star players and your all Americans to show up. And and I'm not saying Terrence Shannon didn't show up, uh, because you know he obviously it's not like he just like withered in the moment, didn't take shots. He just could not. He couldn't make shots. Like he was. Castle did a fantastic job on him. I think Castle's a great defender. Castle's an NBA player. That's why he's going to be a lottery pick. He did a great job on Shannon, and also Shannon didn't necessarily have the greatest approach to the game, but by just kind of trying to attack Klingon and not doing anything in between or anything like that. Um, also, you know, part of the game plan, at least in the first half, after Shannon kind of wasn't getting it at the rim, was like the mask, booty ball, Shannon stand around. And I didn't think that that was the best thing at all either, even though Damas was being very successful with it. Um, it, it just, you never want to see your star player just standing around all the time. I thought there could have been more things to get him involved in, in the game and in a rhythm uh, early on that didn't happen. But I mean, it's, it's an unfortunate way for Terrence Shannon Jr.'s, you know, Illinois career and tournament run to end after the special run he was on where he was averaging 30 points a game. Uh, you know, they, they needed that. They needed a, not a performance equal to that, but something like that to be the team of UConn's caliber. And, you know, when, when you get two or 12, eight points from him, you're not going to win a basketball game. Yeah. I, I mean, Castle deserves all the credit in the world for this. Um, I alluded to it pregame. You got a, a true freshman, like no matter how good Castle is, we all admit he's good. We all know he's a lottery pick talent. We all know he's one of the best perimeter defenders in the country. Thought Terrence Shannon and who he is physically and maturity wise would probably be the first time Castle doesn't look superhuman defensively as a, what is he, 18 year old kid, 19 year old kid? 18. Nope. Nope. Castle tortured that man. And like, at this point, I don't think there's a player in the country Castle can't just erase from a game. Um, But to me, it also does point to like, why you and I were laughing at anyone who said Terrence Shannon was a better player offensively than Dalton Connect. He's not like he's, and if people want to make that argument, he's a more complete player, two sided player, we can have that conversation. We were open to that conversation at the time. But we had a lot of people being like, no, offensively, Shannon's numbers are better. Shannon is a much more limited offensive player. If he's not getting his transition stuff, sometimes he can do this. Sometimes he can disappear in half-court situations. It's why Illinois has ran their half-court offense through Marcus Damas the entire season instead of Terrence Shannon. So, um, once again, on the preview, I thought we nailed that this needed to be a big Damas game. It just needed to be bigger. They needed like 33 from him instead of 17. But I did think Damask was very good. Did you agree on that? Yeah, yeah. No, I thought I thought Damask was very good. And I thought he did take advantage of his matchup. Um, but at, at the same time, like 17 is not gonna get it done. <laughs> 17 is not gonna get it done with Terrence Shannon is not giving you much, and Coleman Hawkins doesn't give you much. You gotta have a nuclear game to even be a part of this. And they weren't able to do that. Um Illinois, Illinois was lucky they didn't lose by 40, too, by the way. Like, I know they were down 40, but they are truly lucky they did not lose by 40 in this game. Tristan Newton didn't make a field goal in this game, G. Like, him and Castle had seven points combined. And they still won by 25. That's crazy. It is crazy. Um, Klingon, I mean, obviously the monster on the defensive side. But the, to me, this was maybe Klingon's most complete performance of his career. 22 points, 10 rebounds, five blocks, an opponent who says we're going to beat Klingon and Klingon single-handedly saying I'm better than every player on your team. Like that's I, – and you you and I have gone back and forth on Klingon a lot. We've made a lot of jokes at his expense. Uh, it, one of our bits in the beginning of the season was is he hurt or is he just playing bad? And I think we settled on the fact he was clearly barely hurt. Um but also, I mean, there have been times we've talked about like Klingon. Klingon is what the people who say Zach Eady is just big is. Uh, it's time for us to eat a lot of crow on Donovan Klingon. I think he's a monster. Yeah, he's definitely a, he's a, he's a monster. Um, I also think that Hurley does a great job with him, like just how he manages him, keeps him fresh, knows that he has that foot injury that's bothered him earlier in the year. Does a great job of like making sure that he's just not overplaying him too. I think. 
um, which is crazy to think because, like, you know, you look at Purdue, they play Zach Eady like 35 minutes a game, right? And he never gets tired. Clayton does get a little bit tired on uh, when he's playing, but her, I think Hurley does a great job keeping him fresh. And look, he's a guy who can dominate basketball games on both ends of the floor because of his size. And in that game, he did this. 22 points, 10 rebounds, three steals to go along with that, five blocks. Like, he would, he dominated this from the start. And I think he did a great job of, one, he was realizing that they, there was no center on the other team. Like, he realized that Coleman Hawkins could not check him one-on-one -on -one in the post. Also, UConn noticed that they could not check him one-on-one -on -one in the post. I mean, we on the flip side, we talked about how Brad was unprepared in this game and didn't have a great game plan. You want to know who was locked in from the, from the jump? Hurley and them off rip off rip. We know we got Donovan Klingon. We know that it's Coleman Hawkins. And for the greater defender as Coleman Hawkins is he's 50 pounds less than Donovan Klingon. And he's given up inches to Klingon as well. So, you know what the first four possessions of the game we're going to do, we're going to swing it around and swing it into Donovan Klingon. And even after he missed that first layup wide open of the game, by the way, they said, nah, here we go. Right back. Da, 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 da. Four times straight down. Klingon, Klingon, Klingon. Nine points before you can even blink. Nine zero, like that's, it's. I mean, levels, levels. I like we're Brad fans, we're Underwood fans, but also like it's, it's, it's levels to this coaching stuff. And Hurley's in the position he's in because of how he operates mentally and how he has his teams prepared. Like he he was locked in. We we didn't question that whatsoever. You saw what the game plan was from the rip, and they they asserted their dominance. Yeah, and then he came out and pulled the tweet from a former Illinois player who is now an ESPN commentator that was basically saying he likes the matchup for Illinois. And in the post-game presser, Hurley just points right to it and says, yeah, that gave me an added chip. Like, this guy is just an all-time manufactured adversity coach. This team is all-time serial killer psychopaths. I think all of these guys individually on individual levels are insane. And I think that's part of what makes them dangerous, truly. I think they have a mental edge, a psychological edge in every single game they've stepped on the court with an opponent for. Um, and, and in order to beat this UConn team, it's going to take an absolutely special performance from everyone. It's going to take your head coach and your coaching staff coming in with a generational game plan that starts with respect for the opponent and like making it abundantly clear you think UConn's the best team in the country. And to be point blank, I don't know that anyone, at least Illinois, obviously, did. I don't know that Purdue's going to have it in them to do that. I don't know. I, the, the way they're behaving right now, I don't know. I don't think anyone's going to be able to put their pride aside and say that team, the defending national champs with the maniac head coach and the lottery picks is the best team in the country. And we're going to have to play our 100 out of 100 game to get them. Like somebody needs to say that before a game here. And I don't think anybody's going to. And that. It bodes well for UConn. <laughs> yeah, two things there. Uh, we saw that in Purdue, they did beat Tennessee. That game plan off rip, though, was not it. And that's why they were down by 11 points. You do that against UConn, you're down 11, and then you don't get back in. Like, they don't like that. That's what happens. And two, just on the topic that you just spoke on. There's a there's a difference between being confident but also respect. You can be confident in your team and confident about how good you are, but like at the same time having a level of respect for like what the other team has done. Like don't just come out there with you know who cares. Like don't discredit what they're doing. They're doing what they're doing for a reason, and you can acknowledge that while also you know being confident in yourself and confident in your team and your abilities. Yeah. So yeah. I I mean, if what the UConn Huskies have done the past two seasons doesn't you know, flip a switch in the opposing coach's head and everyone on the team and everyone's staff, and you're not taking notice and respecting that, then they're probably going to come out and show you why you should. Yeah. And to be clear, I think this was just a Brad problem this week. I think Coleman Hawkins was extremely respectful of UConn talking about how great they are every time he was in front of a microphone. So, um, to, but to me, Brad was not. And that's, listen, you guys know I love Brad. Um, this is not taking anything away. This is not changing the way I feel about Brad Underwood. I love the guy. I think he did a great job this year. This game, the preparation for this game was an all-time black mark on his resume. And uh, we'll see. Opportunities like this, you never know if they come around. Like, it's been 20 years since the last time Illinois made it this far. Is it going to be 20 more? I would. I would highly doubt it. 
but you got to take advantage of opportunities when they come around and they know they they did no show this one they really did um and it was prep it wasn't mental it wasn't emotional it was preparation and getting physically played off the court UConn's worst start is a lottery pick insane they're so good also, also Cam Spencer had 12 11 rebounds and five assists in this game yeah they're so good I hate this team yeah, they're I so hate good. Them, I hate them in like it just like they're they're cooking. I like them, man. I really do. I, I mean, think... I like I like them too, but like it's just, I it it yeah, it's man. it's not fun how much they beat the piss out of everybody. That's what. Yeah, like, I, I I need I need someone. This is why we need the Purdue UConn thing. I think <laughs> Purdue is the only other team that has has it. Purdue needs to come somehow save college basketball, but the problem is. People are going to be wanting UConn to beat the piss out of Purdue to save college basketball from the ref show that is Purdue. <laughs> so, and while everyone and while everyone's worrying about this, uh, they're gonna let they, they're gonna let they already let the fat boy in the Final Four. Oh God, I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, did 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 DJ Burns take over your Dane Danger love? Yeah, it wasn't a Dane game. It was not a Dane game. Honestly, should have been a Dane game. Honestly, it should not have been a Dane game. Dane might have been worse than Ty Rogers in this game. Yeah, true. I, no, hey, relax. Dane's making layups. Was he, though? Because he had three layup attempts that didn't touch the rim in this game. I mean, yeah, he was a little off. He was I, don't off. Think, I don't think Dane's whole Dane shtick works when he's playing a seven-foot-two monster. Man, I'll call it a shtick. He had two blocks. It's a shtick. Um, how does this – like, like, just put a bow on this. How does this – Change the way you remember this Illinois season. Obviously, a very special season. Um, Big Ten tournament championship, an Elite Eight run. Very, very good. How how does it change how you remember it? Uh, I don't know. Every fan, I feel like, or everyone just feels different about this. Like I've known there's been comments about like, uh, you know, we made it this far, da da da. Um, you know, it's easier to even cope with losing by this much instead of like a tight, close game that like eats away at you. Um. I think you remember it for being able to hang a banner, winning the Big Ten tournament. I think that's a lot. I think I think that's something you should hold on to, and finally making the second weekend. Like you exercised your second weekend demons, and you made it that far. With that said, there is an asterisk or a rotten a rotten grape on the stem, in my opinion, uh, that you went out the way you went out. Yeah, it is what it is. Like you're not going to be able to mention this season without mentioning how like UConn put a 30 0 run on you in the second half. Yeah. I think uh, the hardest part for me is you could see from outside looking in how much this group loved each other. And we, I made fun of it in the summer when like Ty was doing the press tour. Remember that? He was doing doing all the podcast appearances, telling everybody, no, this season's going to be different. It's going to be special because we got people who want it. We got good people. The bad people left. The good people are here. And I was like, you need good basketball players, my friend. Like, that, come on. And I was right. I was wrong. Partially because these guys were a lot better at basketball than I – like Marcus DeMass just a way better basketball player than I realized. But – this locker room was a special one. There was a very, very special level of team chemistry here. There was a maturity here that was once in a decade, I would say. Like it, teams like this don't come around often the way they mesh, especially in the portal era, especially with how Brad's going to build these teams. Like you just saw in a back to back two year stretch, you saw the very worst of what a locker room can look like and the very best of what a locker room can look like. And it is there, some of that is a dice roll. Because you don't know what type of people you're getting when you go play the portal game every summer. And Brad's going to keep playing the portal game. This team's going to lose Coleman Hawkins. This team's going to lose Marcus DeMass. This team's going to lose Terrence Shannon. This team's going to lose Quincy Garrier. This team's going to lose Justin Harmon. There's 80% of your production. So he's going to go get new faces in the portal, and we'll see how good of people they are, how mature they are, how good at basketball they are. But the the hard part for me is, like, you want to remember this group so much for – just the chemistry and who they were as people. And I think you can, but it would have been a lot easier to remember that if they had given UConn their best fight, right? Like just, just make it a competitive game. And you're so damn proud of all this group did. Instead, you're like, Oh my God, guys, like (laughs) 
what a what a horrible way for a great team to go out. And uh, you have to give credit to UConn because I think UConn forced this much more than Illinois gave it to them. But I don't know. It was, it was just a weird weird. I feel, I think they're gonna look back and feel like they wasted an opportunity for years. Yeah, they they went out sad. Just to wrap it up, they did. Unfortunately. Uh, I'm trying to. I feel like I have a couple more very quick things. Coleman Hawkins telling people he believes he's done at Illinois. First off, cheers to you, Coleman Hawkins, three-time Big Ten champion. Uh, you shut us up. You proved us wrong. Great career. We have had a blast watching you play basketball. Do you believe him? Yeah. He won't play another game at Illinois. He won't play another game of college basketball of college basketball because that's a very different sentence than I'm done at Illinois. I think he's done with college basketball. Okay. What percent are you on that? Honestly, a hundred. hundred. Okay. Okay. Are you? Not sure. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not sure. I'd love to I'd love to ask Coleman. Um look, I I don't think you should ever like believe what players say right after a loss like this just because emotions are high and you don't know. Uh if, for the record, it sounds like Illinois is going to try to get him back despite whatever he's telling people. So, I think like there is absolutely a world where like the money they just paid Terrence Shannon and Marcus Damas goes to Coleman Hawkins to return for his COVID year next year. Um, and that might be a more appealing offer than trying to play the NBA draft. I did find the way Coleman used his terminology on this interesting, to say the least. And again, I'm not going to overthink too much because it was right at the end of the game. But he didn't pointedly say, I'm ready for the NBA. He said, that was my last game at Illinois. That's two very different things. Um Look, we've seen really great players at really great college basketball programs get seven-figure offers to go play elsewhere. I would think if Coleman Hawkins wanted that and was open to it, he would probably get that. Now, Illinois also has the money to match. So, like, Coleman Hawkins through and through is a program guy. I'm not saying he's not. He's To me, he's what Illinois basketball is right now. He's everything that's good about Illinois basketball. So – if Coleman does decide he wants the highest paycheck to play college basketball, I think he would get that at Illinois regardless. I, I just don't know if in his head he's done with college yet. I don't know. The thing is, in my opinion, I don't think that he's done. Like, I don't think it's a money thing for me. If I'm Coleman, I'm kind, I've am i kind of worn out my Orange Crush Illinois fandom like welcome at this point. It's a lot, right? It gets a little yeah. stagnant, right? Like yeah, it's like a lot. Like you, I mean, like I, I just always look back to the point last season where it was when Coleman was touching the ball, there was an audible groan that went over the crowd, and like uh, before he even did anything, people were upset. I felt like, and I feel like that took a turn this year. Uh, I think that Coleman, you know, was able his his impact was felt a lot more, and he was a lot. Well, 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 more, rece- more well received, in my opinion, across just like college fan base in general and Illinois fans in general. Um, but like eventually, like, you know, you don't wear out your welcome, but like change is somewhat needed. Uh, with that said, I got a spot for you to yell if you want. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think, man, because like I when I did this with my own player a summer ago with Hunter Dickinson there were some very obvious like landing spots that I felt like made a lot of sense. Um, I don't feel like Kansas wouldn't make a lot of sense to me right now for Coleman. Is there any, if he was going to look at college basketball option, like Kentucky would Kentucky give seven figures to Coleman Hawkins. I mean, I don't know what they gave to Trey Mitchell, but I would ask for double that from Coleman. (laughs) Right. North, North Carolina. I was just gonna say he's a West Coast kid from Sacramento. I don't know if like he's like spinning the block with like a USC, UCLA. There's a lot of influx stuff with those programs right now, and like leave the Big Ten just to come back to the Big Ten. 
That would if I'm Coleman, I'd want to get out. Imagine the Coleman Hawkins return game to State Farm and he's on another team. Yeah. I mean, insane. I for the record, I think it's 98% likely Coleman Hawkins. Actually, no, I think it's 88% he's done with college. I think it's I think it's 10% he's back at Illinois. I think it's a two percent chance he plays college basketball for someone else. But that's not a hundred. That's not a zero. Just just want to cover our bases there. Uh, da, 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 da. I think that's everything. Sorry, Illinois fans. So close. Fun, se- fun season with y'all, man. Fun season. It was fun. Thanks for all the support. Thank you for uh, watching these videos, for liking, subscribing. You guys have helped us grow this channel a lot. We will be here forever. We'll be here next season. And uh, I'm excited to see what y'all do in the offseason. There's rumors of some very big names. We'll have a lot of offseason content coming on what to expect from Illinois, what we're hearing behind the scenes in the near future. With that said, don't hang your head for too long because uh, as bad as this game was, everything's on the up and up. Dre Gibbs Lawhorn's coming back, and that's that's really all that matters here. So congratulations, Illinois. You have Dre Gibbs Lawhorn in the fold for year two is my bookie my bookie is our favorite place to place bets and you can place bets with us car tell the people about my bookie let me tell you about my bookie quickly here it has absolutely everything you need it has odds boosts parlays expert predictions alternate lines anything that you need my bookie makes it easy to play your way and get paid and right now we have a first deposit bonus up to a thousand dollars if you use promo code sleepers that's promo code sleepers for i almost messed that up greg but it's promo code sleepers for a first deposit bonus of up to a thousand dollars the madness is winding down but there's still plenty of time to get some bets out there do so with my bookie the official sports book of sleepers media yeah that's promo code sleepers or as card says promo code sleepers it's <laughs> promo code sleepers uh thank you my bookie link in the description of this video Uh, We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the video.